It's a hunter's nightmare. Plummeting 25 feet from a tree stand, smashing into the ground. I just couldn't understand what was going on. Then, excruciating pain racks his body. It's a constant sharp shooting pain. Somebody help! He's so deep in the woods, help! no one can hear his cries for help. And the threat of a coyote attack is very real. That's the scariest sound that you can hear. He tries to stand, but his legs are paralyzed. He must get out of the woods and get help fast. The only thing I knew to do was crawl. It will take superhuman strength and an unwavering faith in God for this hunter to save his own life. In the wild, when things go bad, they go bad fast. Without warning, your life can hang by a thread. Adventurer and survivor Craig DiMartino fought back from his own wilderness disaster to reclaim his life. Now Craig meets other courageous outdoorsmen who beat the odds and return from their own fight to survive. I'm Craig DiMartino. Nathan Holcomb was enjoying an afternoon of bow hunting from his tree stand when the next thing he knew, he was lying on the ground looking up through a haze of confusion, his body racked with pain. It's exactly what I experienced when I fell during my own rock climbing accident. How quickly life can change. How quickly you find yourself fighting for your life. Nathan Holcomb was born a jock. Throughout his school years, he made every team he tried out for. But baseball and then softball were the sports he really excelled in. Nathan was so good, he was spotted by scouts and invited to play professional travel softball. When it came time to earn a steady living, teaching and coaching were a good fit. Whether it's in the classroom, on the field, I love to see the kids succeed. If I can make a difference in one kid's life, I have done enough. While working at Southern Alamance High School in North Carolina, Nathan became friends with the dad of one of his most dedicated student ball players. I've known Nathan nine years. He was kind of a mentor to my son, Jeremy. You won't find a better guy. Uh, great friend, great leader, a great mentor to everybody. What's the game plan for tomorrow? Hope we do better than we did last year. <laughs> we love to laugh, we love to joke, we love to hunt. Eddie was a champion archer besides being an avid bow hunter. He was happy to make Nathan a convert to his weapon of choice for hunting. You have to be so quiet. It's not about the kill, it's about the experience of being out in the woods and, and seeing all the deer. After marrying Brandy, another great athlete and coach, Nathan relocated to be with her in Tennessee. But this didn't mean he would give up hunting in North Carolina with his buddy Eddie. In September of 2010, Nathan made the eight hour drive to Eddie's house. The plan was to hunt white-tailed deer the next day. Eddie had been hunting on 800 acres of private land for nearly 25 years. He had motion-triggered infrared cameras set up to get pictures of deer and other game day and night. I got these pictures from the camera last night. Nice. Based on the images his cameras captured, That's a nice deer. he had strategically set up a dozen tree stands. Uh, yeah. All set, let's go. We got up early to go out hunting the next morning. That should be pretty nice up there. It's kind of funny, we all draw straws to pick where we want to go. There's so many places knowing that I may not be able to come back anytime soon, they let me pick first. Get up close to it, probably within a quarter of a mile or something. Yep. A quarter of a mile is not that far to walk. They drove to the edge of a field roughly a quarter of a mile away from the tree stands. We always say that the peak hunting is 30 minutes after daylight. And so we like to get there, you know, maybe 30 minutes before the daylight breaks so that everything can kind of settle down a little bit. Deer can smell human scent up to a half mile away, let alone the exhaust from a car or truck. They didn't want to scare any off. After hooking in, sitting down and hanging up his gear, Nathan began the hunter's vigil he texted Eddie to see what was literally going on in his neck of the woods. The response was not much. It was going to be one of those hot September days when the heat, mosquitoes, and inactivity would drive them out of the woods by 10 in the morning. You get bored. If you get in a stand an hour before daylight and it doesn't get daylight till six o'clock, your rear end gets sore if you sit there so long. Yeah, we 
They went back to Eddie's to get a bite to eat and kill some time before heading out again in the late afternoon. Between watching the football game and both of us dozing, it got to be later than we wanted it to be, and we rushed out of the house. Pull behind schedule. <laughs> we always keep our clothes in a tub that were unscented, and I'd never seen Nathan Hunt without a harness on. Never, not one time. And he left his harness laying on top of his tub. I literally walked right past it that day. Nathan picked a different location for the afternoon hunt. Let me start this place a little bit tricky. This time, he needed Eddie's ATV to get to his spot. All right, good luck. Eddie said, OK, you know where everything is. I'm going right up here. And he showed me right where he was going. I said, OK, text you in a little while. The place where Nate was hunting that day was an overgrown field. It had overgrown grass about waist high. We called it the little field. It hadn't been hunted yet at all that particular season. Nathan drove the ATV to the edge of the woods and parked far enough away so the deer wouldn't hear it or catch the scent of the exhaust. That left him around 300 yards to walk to the stand. The stand is about 25 feet off the ground up in this big tree. I latched my bow to the pull-up rope, put my backpack on my back, and started climbing up the tree. After getting settled on the stand, Nathan hung up his backpack and pulled up his bow. Then he knocked an arrow and put his release on his hand. Finally, he sat back and texted his wife and then Eddie to check in and say he was A-OK. -okay. After I put the phone away, I remember seeing myself start to go forward. Nathan had no idea that the straps holding the stand to the tree had snapped without warning. He had just fallen 25 feet and slammed into the ground. Nathan Holcomb was hunting white-tailed deer when he toppled headfirst out of a tree stand. This was the one day in memory he had not worn his safety harness. And the next thing I remember is I look up and I'm laying on the ground. He had just plummeted 25 feet into the ground, conscious but confused. Within seconds, he was jolted into a new awareness of the pain that now wrapped his body. It didn't really feel real. I, I just couldn't understand for a minute what was going on. The pain was excruciating. Blood was pouring out of his mouth. He had damage to his ribs. His right wrist was broken, and one finger was dislocated. But worse, he couldn't feel his legs. So one of the things that kind of struck me with your story was... Craig DiMartino fell 100 feet in a rock climbing accident. He was struck with the similarities of Nathan's story. When I was looking back up at the cliff, I just couldn't figure out what had just happened. And what was that like when you realized I'm on the ground looking up? I was a little bit confused and I knew that I needed to call for help. So I started trying to reach and grab my cell phone because I knew I just had it and realized I'd left it up in my backpack. I tried to stand up three times because I knew I had no feeling in my legs. Were you scared? Were you panicking at that point? In the beginning, you always think the worst. Oh God, I know that it's broke. I'm going to be paralyzed from the waist down for the rest of my life. Help! Somebody help! Help! I yelled for help. I mean, that's what you do if you're in trouble, right? You, right. Yell, for, you yell for help for somebody to help you. Right. I knew the closest person was Eddie and he was a mile away. Right. There was no chance he was gonna hear me yelling for help. I knew that I had to, to do something fast because of the threat of coyotes. They were all in those woods. He knew he was injured prey to a hungry pack of coyotes. The coyotes will attack in a pack. To be sitting there and, and you hear them, that's the scariest sound that you can hear. 
I've got to do something to get out of here. There was only one possible exit plan. He had to get himself to his ATV 300 yards away and drive back to Eddie. He tried to stand one more time, but his legs just didn't work. I took a minute and I, and I prayed. Lord, please. Lord, show me the way out of here, Lord, please. I said, Lord, you gotta help me. Just please get me out of here. And the only way that I knew at that point was to crawl. Rolled over on my belly, used my elbows, and I crawled like the, an army. Got up to the top of the hill. And I had only gone probably 50 yards and I was exhausted. Nathan Holcomb has just crawled with a broken back 50 yards. He's exhausted and in blinding pain and still needs to crawl 250 more in order to reach his ATV. His hunting buddy, Eddie, has no idea Nathan was seriously injured by a fall. Nathan was now on top of a hill. He realized he had only one option to survive this next hurdle. I rolled, you know, like little kids just roll down a hill. I get down to the bottom, and at this point, I'm in pain, but adrenaline has taken over. Um, angels took over, something took over, because I should not be able to move with the amount of pain that I'm in. Um, the amount of blood that I've got coming out of my mouth is unbelievable. His elbows and knees were raw and bloodied from crawling, and he still was 200 yards from the ATV. Even worse, it was uphill from where he now was. I start trying to go, and I start sliding back down. <laughs> to his left, he saw young saplings. <laughs> Using them like rungs of a ladder, he pulled himself up the hill, three to four feet at a time, <laughs> only using his good arm. <laughs> Finally, Nathan reached the ATV. I pull myself up on the edge of my four-wheeler. I lay my chest on it just to rest for a second. And when I did, I lost my balance and I fell off. So I had to start all over again. Nathan tried one more time. And that's when I really started to, to panic because I knew that this is how I get to my help. Right. And I can't get on my help. Right. And, and it was so frustrating that I remember sliding off for the second time and thinking, I've got to get on this thing or I, it, I'm not going to make it. I have to do this. Right. And that was the hardest part. <laughs> Nathan maneuvered himself into the driver's seat. Luckily, he had left the keys in the ignition. Now he needs to get to Eddie. I pull it in gear and back up to go back around this field to go where he's at. He's about a mile from me. I take off around that field. Four-wheeler trails are not smooth by any means. I'm feeling every bump ah. of every rock from my low back all the way up to the top of my head. It's a constant sharp shooting pain through my body the whole way. And I'm going as quickly as I can. I'm not wasting time. If I'm ever gonna be able to walk, then I've gotta get somewhere to get help as quickly as I can. Nathan finally made it to Eddie's stand. He rode up within 30 yards of where I was sitting and said, Eddie, I fell out. Oh you kidding me? No, I fell out of my tree stand, Eddie. And I still thought he was kidding. I thought he shot a big buck 
and wanted me to come get on the ATV with him, but I could see his face was just pale white. Hurry! So I came down the tree Coming, buddy. as fast as I could come down. I can't feel my legs any. I could see his right wrist was broke. And I'll never forget the look on his face. And I knew Nate. Get you some help hanging there. With what he had going for him in life. But there was a chance that this guy would never be the same again. 911, what is the address of your emergency? Yeah, my buddy just fell out of his tree stand. Yeah, buddy. Eddie had taken advanced life-saving yeah. courses, so when he called 911, he gave them critical information about Nathan's yeah. injuries. I told the lady that he, he had a spinal, spinal injury. injury. He can't feel his legs. I said he may have already done more damage than need be. Eddie put the seat back in his truck and dragged Nathan to it one foot at a time. On the drive back into town, he helped Nathan make calls. I'm gonna call Brandy for you, okay? To his wife and mother, who were both hours away. Brandy? Brandy, hey, it's me. Hey, I fell out of my stand. I'm hurt bad. Eddie drove Nathan to the volunteer fire station, where a waiting life flight helicopter flew Nathan to UNC Chapel Hill Hospital. There, renowned neurosurgeon Dr. Eldad J. Hadar and his team just happened to be on call. How you doing, Nathan? Not so good. You've hurt your back badly. The x-rays are uh, show a lot of damage in there. We're gonna have to get you into the OI right away. Not paralyzed. We can't tell. Uh, the the film is really inclusive. Uh, there's a lot of damage in there. When the doctor gave Nathan the prognosis, Nathan had the most hollow eyes I've ever seen on anybody. And that's when I, that's when I realized that it, this wasn't a, this wasn't a joke. You know, somebody's life has been tremendously affected. And Nate, never find a fighter fella. Why? That's all I could get out of my, out of, out of me was why it happened to me. You're all right, buddy. We'll take good care of you. After assessing Nathan's condition, he was rushed into surgery. By the time Nathan was out of the six hours of surgery, his family had gathered at the hospital. Nathan, how you doing? You awake yet? Just want to let you know, surgery went well, okay? But at this point, I'm not sure if you're gonna walk or run again. The doctor tells me, he says, surgery went great, but I'm not gonna guarantee you will ever walk again. I'm not gonna guarantee you'll ever run. And, and I said, and that's good news? I was, I was scared. I was scared. Right. I've always been able to do whatever I wanted to do. This cannot be happening to me. I realized that, yes, this has happened. And now we have to figure out how to get over this. Right. We're going to make this happen. There's going to, I'm not going to not walk again. Before his paralyzing accident, Nathan Holcomb had only been married for a month. Surgery had gone well. But at this point, I'm not sure if you're going to walk or run again. Now this new husband, teacher, and professional athlete faced an uncertain future. Greg DiMartino recalls with Nathan what it was like to talk to their wives after their accidents. One of the hardest things for me was talking to Cindy. When you saw Brandy for that first time, what was going through your mind? You know, I, I told her she didn't sign up for this. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> right. Why should my new wife have to push me around in a wheelchair for the rest of my life? How fair is that? I really didn't know what to say, but I'm so glad you're here. And what was her reaction when you said? I'm not going anywhere. Right. What do you think it's done for your marriage? We spent 
a month out of the first two months of our marriage in a hospital. It made us so much stronger. You never really know somebody until you go through something like this. A week into rehab, the feeling started coming back into Nathan's legs. Four weeks later, he walked out, aided by a walker, and began a period of outpatient physical therapy. What was it like for you? Was it just this demoralizing grind? I mean, for me, it was really, really hard and humbling. What was it like for you? We're gonna teach you to do all these things all over again, just like you're a baby. Right. We're gonna teach you to take your first step again. They had to teach me to stand up. I'm 260 pounds of athlete. There's zero chance I should be in here right now. But boy, did they put me through the ringer and put me to work. Eight months after Nathan's surgery, he was able to suit up and play ball in a local game. It was kind of like a baby taking his first steps. I was so nervous. There you go. And I hit a home run. That's kind of when all the emotion kind of caught up with me. Nathan still hunts. He had some good luck on his first outing back in the woods with Eddie. Being the hunter that he is, he had a five-pointer come in that day. And he said, hey, man, I've got a five-pointer out here. I said, no way. I said, how long has it been since you shot a deer? He said, oh, I'm not going to shoot that. It's too little. He said, I just enjoy the hunt. Hey, we're going to pray. Can you close your eyes? If it weren't for God, the power of prayer. Thank you, God, for the food. Amen. Amen. We'll tell you right now. He wouldn't be walking. He wouldn't be putting one foot in front of the other. He would have to be holding his kids while riding in a wheelchair. Nathan, too, has no doubt how he survived his fall and recovery. God played the part in me getting out of those woods. You know, I, there, there was nothing that I would have been able to do by myself, none. I, I, can, I can honestly say that, yes, he was the whole reason that I was able to get out. Tree stand falls are the leading cause of injuries to hunters in this country. Nathan's recovery is a testament to his strength and determination. His story has a happy ending, but that's not always the case. Be safe, wear your harness. Your next hunting trip shouldn't become a fight to survive.